Hello everyone. On behalf of ANROSE, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, What We Know About Intimate Partner Homicide. My name is Padma Raman and I'm the CEO of ANROSE. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the country on which we meet today. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my deep respects to elders past, present and emerging. Wherever we are today, we're on unceded Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land, and I acknowledge and pay respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the webinar today. In today's webinar, we'll hear from three presenters highlighting the key evidence on an intimate partner homicide. Following the presentations, there will be a live Q&A, so please send through questions at any time during the course of the discussion, and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. The research and resources related to the topic today are available in the handout section of the GoToWebinar. If you'd like to access closed captions, please click on the link provided in the chat box. The, when, the webinar will be recorded and be available on the ANROSE website as soon as possible. You can subscribe to the Evidence Base uh, newsletter to be no, notified of when it's available. Finally, we will have a survey that will pop up as you exit the webinar. If you could take a couple of minutes to complete it, we'd really appreciate your feedback. This is a confronting topic and some participants might find it distressing. It is important to take care of yourself while watching this webinar. If you'd like to access support, please contact 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732 or Lifeline on 13 double one one four. This webinar will be focusing on what we know about intimate partner homicide in Australia, the gaps that remain in our knowledge and also what we understand about perpetrators of homicides of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander victims. Two of our presenters will be speaking to ANRO's research released earlier this year and we will be sharing these reports in the chat. After the success of the ANROSE conference held in February, we decided to bring together the panel again to share this important research with our wider audience. So I'd like to introduce you to our presenters today. We have Anna Butler from the New South Wales Domestic Violence Death Review Team, Department of Communities and Justice, and also a member of the Australian Domestic and Family Violence Death Review Network. We have Dr. Haley Boxall from the Australian Institute of Criminology, and we have Dr. Kylie Cripps from the University of New South Wales. Our first presenter, Anna Butler, will draw on available qu quantitative data to lay out what we know about intimate partner homicide in Australia and where gaps in our knowledge remain. This data is captured in the report titled Australian Domestic and Family Violence Death Review Data Report Intimate Partner Violence Homicides 2010 to 2018. It's a very long title. Um, can I hand over to you, Anna? Thanks a lot, Padma. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all working today. I'm speaking from Gadigal land, and today I'm presenting in my capacity as one of the founding members of the Australian Domestic and Family Violence Death Review Network. So before I take you to some of the key findings from our recent report that Padma has just mentioned, um, I'll just give you a really brief background to the domestic violence death review process um, and how this works to contribute to a more kind of comprehensive and nuanced understanding of intimate partner homicide in Australia. So in the late 90s across Australia, feminist activists and others in the domestic violence sector began campaigning for there to be specialised reviews into the deaths of women that were killed um, in a context of domestic violence. So the idea being that the deaths that occur following an identifiable history of violence exhibit identifiable and predictable patterns and that learnings should be derived from these deaths um, to, to guide reform of the domestic violence response system more broadly and, and thereby to prevent future deaths. So most Australian states and territories now have a permanent domestic, violence, domestic and family violence death review mechanism. Um, Tasmania is currently the only jurisdiction without a formal review process, although I do note it's not for the want of trying. Um, and there is work ongoing in that jurisdiction to get a review function across the line. 
So in 2011, me and my fellow state and territory death review counterparts established the network under a mandate to analyse and improve knowledge about domestic violence deaths and to share findings and recommendations across jurisdictions that could inform intervention and prevention efforts um, and, and thereby improve the domestic violence response system. For all of us, this work was effectively done off the side of our desks. However, um, I think really it sort of demonstrates goodwill and the strong relationships between the state and territory members. And that's meant that we've been able to navigate some of the um, kind of quite not insignificant challenges of interjurisdictional information sharing. Um, we've developed the first national data set of intimate partner violence context homicides. And then in 2018, the network self-published its first data report. Um, following release of that report in 2020, Anne Rose was funded to work in partnership with the network to produce the second edition um, of, of that data report, as well as to undertake work in relation to domestic violence context filicides and domestic violence risk indicators. So I would also like, on, you know, on behalf of the network, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Anne Rose for its commitment to progressing this important work, and we are all cautiously optimistic that there will be the opportunity to continue this partnership beyond the current project. Uh, so turning to the second edition of the data report, broadly uh, the report presents almost a decade of national data in relation to the deaths of people who were killed by their current or former intimate partner following an identifiable history of domestic violence. So our work looks at homicides um, perpetrated by both men and women and includes cases that are dealt with by the courts and then also murder-suicide cases that are finalised by way of coronial proceedings. Um, death reviews are you know, really uniquely positioned to provide insights into the victims and the perpetrators' experiences of violence in the weeks, months and often years that preceded the fatal episode and then to explore how the system and the community responded to that abuse. As part of the qualitative review process, death review teams develop in-depth case studies and it's from these case studies that the, the detail and contextualised data for this report has been derived. So the report presents a range of demographic and case characteristic data um, and you know, I guess while these might be very well recognised by this audience, these findings are important in addressing misconceptions about domestic violence that persist not only in the broader community, but also within the response system itself. So our findings highlight that women can experience domestic violence at any age, that fatal, that fatal violence can occur in relationships of any length, that separation does not equal safety, and that despite decades of intervention, people who identify as Aboriginal continue to be overrepresented as victims and perpetrators of domestic violence homicide. Um, so in the short time that we've got today, I'm just going to take you through some of the report's key data findings um, and we've sort of centred these on the domestic violence victims experience. So looking first at the primary victim, primary abuser status of the parties. So the report explores the histories of violence that preceded the homicide to identify the predominant domestic violence abuser and victim in each relationship. Analysis of this kind um, is important, particularly in circumstances where the history of violence was unreported, as the true domestic violence context is often lost or diluted in the formal proceedings that follow a homicide. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, and I'll come back to this idea in a minute. So information regarding histories of violence was derived from a variety of sources, including police and court records, anecdotal an um, accounts by friends, family, neighbours and colleagues, victim impact statements, phone records um, and records from various services like health, domestic and family violence specialists, housing and child protection. Our analysis revealed that nearly all of the male homicide offenders had been the primary user of domestic violence behaviours against the woman that they killed. And in the rare cases where a female homicide offender killed a male partner, she was also likely to be the primary domestic violence victim. So this finding is important, um, I think, in you know rejecting the characterisation of offenders as a kind of good guy that just snapped, um, victims as you know giving as good as she got, or where it sort of you know the analysis devolves into the relationship just being toxic or dysfunctional, or the case you know simply being kind of regarded as an unexplainable tragedy. 
Importantly, this finding also invites, and I think this is a really important point, some further interrogation of how the criminal justice system currently responds to victims of violence who kill their abuser. Um, so turning now to the types of abuse that were evident across the cases. So death review processes draw into sharp focus the extent to which victims' experiences of violence can be rendered invisible in the formal justice proceedings that follow a homicide. These proceedings are designed to interrogate the offender's actions and behaviour in the period immediately surrounding the homicide. And you know, to some extent, um, this can kind of sideline the victim's experiences of abuse. The complex evidentiary and procedural frameworks that govern these proceedings mean that much of the perpetrator's abusive behaviour never makes it into the inquest or the trial or the sentencing proceedings. And as for the most part, the primary victim is absent from proceedings, perpetrators can be positioned to dominate the narrative and continue to kind of actively conceal their true history of abuse. The data presented in this report explores six abuse types that primary abusers used against victims prior to the homicide. So we looked at um, emotional and psychological abuse, social abuse, financial abuse, stalking and surveillance, sexual abuse and physical abuse. So emotional and psychological abuse was evident in over 80% of cases in which a male primary domestic violence abuser killed a female victim. And this included a broad spectrum of behaviours employed by abusers sort of intentionally and as a kind of repeated pattern to frighten, belittle, humiliate and undermine the woman's sense of self-worth and autonomy. Almost two thirds of victims were known to have experienced social abuse and abusers again used a range of tactics to isolate women from their support networks and effectively entrapping the woman within their sphere of control. More than 40% of um, victims were subjected to stalking or surveillance behaviours by the abuser and more often um, this, this type of behaviour was evident while the relationship was still ongoing. So this included abusers monitoring the victim's phone, email and social media accounts, tracking their day-to-day -day movements, um, as well as some of you know, what might be kind of more widely recognised stalking behaviours, such as physically following the victim. Over a quarter of victims were known to have experienced financial abuse. And I think this is an area that's really just sort of starting to come to the fore um, and, and you know, a growing awareness of the extent to which um, victims are subjected to financial abuse. 16% um, of women were identified as having experienced sexual violence prior to the homicide. However, I think, you know, given what we know from the population studies like the um, personal safety survey, this likely represents an undercount. And I think this raises some really important considerations of the persistent issues that may hinder disclosure and um, reporting of sexual abuse. So this can be, you know, this, whether that's sort of stigma and shame or a lack of confidence in the justice system to adequately respond to sexual violence, or as we also see in our cases, victims believing or, you know, being conditioned to believe that certain sexually abusive behaviours are a normal part of a relationship dynamic. Um, finally, in terms of, of abuse types, and again, this is, I think, a really important finding, in more than one-fifth of cases, there was no evidence of physical violence prior to the homicide. So the high prevalence of non-physical abuse tactics demonstrates the need for services and first responders to better recognise um, beyond the use of physical violence, the pattern of abusive and controlled behaviours that signifies domestic violence and to you know, really reinforce an understanding that any relationship that exhibits domestic violence, whether that be physical or non-physical, is one that's embedded with a risk of lethality. Um, these findings have informed current discourse regarding the extent to which the criminal justice system can adequately and appropriately respond to non-physical manifestations of abuse and also um, to, to the current debates around criminalising coercive control. As many of you are no doubt aware, in December last year, the New South Wales government responded to recommendations of the Joint Select Committee on Coercive Control and announced that it will act to introduce a new offence of coercive control in New South Wales later this year. Um, and the Queensland government is currently considering the recent report of the Women's Safety and Justice Task Force, which has similarly recommended that coercive control be criminalised in that state. Um, this is obviously a big topic and one that we don't have time to discuss in any detail today, but I think it is important to acknowledge the positive impact that these developments have had, you know, so far as 
introducing the concept of coercive control into the mainstream and providing a better understanding um, of the complexity of domestic violence. It remains to be seen, of course, um, how effective these legislative reforms will be in addressing the deficiencies in existing legal system responses, which you know, I think many would recognise for the most part remain incident focused and prioritise physical violence over non-physical forms of abuse. Um, so the report presents findings around histories of protection orders, and these of course are a critical component of the response system. Um, but these findings, I guess, I think they also kind of invite a consideration of misidentification of primary victim and the potential for systems abuse. Um, the network has not yet reported on the prevalence of system abuse across our cases, but our data relating to domestic violence um, orders provide some insight into the way that abusers can manipulate the protection order system to further their control over the victim. So this could be done by making false allegations of violence or taking out retaliatory cross orders against the victim. Systems abuse of this kind um, has you know, some really devastating impacts on victims and there's a growing body of research that speaks to that cumulative harm um, and, and can really act to restrict the access, um, you know, restrict a victim's access to protection and support and I think can really kind of erode victims' confidence in the response system. In the, context, <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of male perpetrated um, intimate partner violence homicide, one, in one in five cases there was current domestic violence order between the male offender and the female victim at the time of the homicide. However, one in 10 of these orders um, in fact protected the male abuser from the female victim. So while this finding speaks to a broader issue, as I've said, around the misidentification of primary abuser um, by responders, it does also invite further interrogation of how abusers can co-opt systems to control victims. Another key finding in the report relates to separation. Um, as many of you would be aware, separation is a time of heightened risk for victims of violence. For many abusers, separation represents the ultimate loss of control and they may escalate their abusive behaviours in an attempt to reassert control. Um, the report presents detailed findings around separation, including the intention to separate, where the relationship was in fact still on foot. Um, and then we also look at separation, the proximity of separation to the homicide. So in over a third of male perpetrated intimate partner violence homicides, the couple had separated prior to the homicide, with separation most likely having to occur within three months. Um, for those couples where the relationship was ongoing, the data reveals that it was also common for the woman to be killed after expressing an intention to separate. These findings present, I guess, a really important counterpoint to the kind of why doesn't she just leave rhetoric that still pervades the domestic violence dialogue and also has um, some really important implications for responders undertaking risk assessment and safety planning with victims of violence. Um, then finally, taking a broader view of victims in the cases examined in this report, we found that of the 311 intimate partner violence homicides in the data set, there were at least 172 children under the age of 18 who survived the homicide involving one or both of their parents. This group of 172 children represents a highly vulnerable and highly traumatised cohort for whom integrated, specific and consistent service responses are critical. So I guess, you know, just to kind of wrap it up, um, improving our understanding of the characteristics and dynamics that precede an intimate partner violence homicide and particularly the victim's experiences can help to guide reform of the domestic and family violence response system. In undertaking this work, you know, we're aiming to contribute to the formation of evidence-based policy and decision-making in relation to domestic and family violence. Um, and to sort of highlight and enhance opportunities for intervention and prevention, um, you know, obviously all working towards a common goal of improving the safety and supports for victims of violence and, and having a system that holds abusers to account. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. That's so much to take in. I guess um, one of the really sobering reflections for me is that with any form of, where there's any form of violence, there's a risk of um, lethality. Uh, incredibly sobering. Moving now to um, Haley's work, focusing on the life course trajectories of intimate partner homicide offenders. 
Hayley will offer us further insights into what we know about intimate partner homicides in Australia and map out possible points of intervention along the way. These pathways are captured in great detail in the second ANROS report, the Pathways to Intimate Partner Homicide Project, Key Stages and Events in Male Perpetrated Intimate Partner Homicides in Australia. Thanks, Hayley. Thanks, Padma. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I'm dialing in from, which is the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging and extend those respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be online with us today. So today I'm going to be talking about the Pathways into Intimate Partner Homicide Project. And this is definitely a massive piece of work which required many, many different people contributing at different kinds of stages. So I'd just like to acknowledge my amazing colleagues, um, our steering committee who gave up of gave up their free time to contribute their understandings to the project, as well as ANROS for funding this research. So in Australia, we're quite lucky in the sense that we have a number of different research programs that have that try to understand the occurrence of intimate partner homicide in Australia. So Anna has just spoken to the fabulous work of the Death Review Network. We also have the Counting Dead Women database and we have the National Homicide Monitoring Program that's um, running out of the AIC. But what we wanted to do with this project was to take a bit more of an aerial view to actually kind of look at the life course trajectories of intimate partner homicide offenders and victims in Australia to identify potential points of intervention, but in particular, those major events, milestones, um, things of note that emerge to different stages of the life course that could potentially increase people's risk of being um, murdered by their partner or perpetrating a murder against their partner. So what we did was we took a sample of approximately 200 intimate partner homicide cases in Australia where the perpetrator was a male and the victim was a current or former female intimate partner. And we accessed sentencing remarks, coronial records and a bunch of other data to basically try to understand what was happening within the relationship, but also importantly, what was happening prior to the relationship and what was happening in the lead up to the homicide. Because I think we need to remember that People come into relationships with their own baggage, with their own life histories. Life doesn't just start when you meet your partner. And so we really wanted to understand developmentally what was happening in the lives of these offenders. So there's a lot of detail, nuanced and exquisite detail about how we actually did the research in the report itself. Um, so I encourage all of you to go and have a bit of a look at it. Um, but for time being, I'm just going to kind of skim over that and we'll get straight into the findings. So the headline figure from our project was that of the 200 cases that we looked at, we identified three pathways. So this is three different cohorts of offenders whose trajectories to intimate partner homicide looked different from the others in very kind of key ways. There were of course cases that included elements of two or three of the pathways um, and we called them crossover cases. And we also had cases that fell outside of our typology which didn't really kind of accord with any of the pathways that we identified. And we called them outliers. But about 90% of our sample fell neatly within one of these three pathways, which is really encouraging because at least it kind of tells us that for the majority of cases that we looked at, we were able to classify them um, easily, I guess. Although I say easily, there was a lot of debate within the team about where different cases lay and those kinds of things. So I don't want it to come across as like, this is a very easy cut and dry kind of process. It is definitely a lot of subjective conjecture as well. So I'm gonna take us through the pathways now, if I can remember how to share my screen. Sharing, don't judge my desktop. I know I have a lot of icons. Okay. All right, so our first trajectory is what we called fixated threat. And this is very consistent with um, the work of Jane Monkton Smith in the UK um, when she articulated the eight stage trajectory to homicides for any of you who are familiar with her work. However, while um, Jane Monkton Smith believed that the eight stages to homicide accounted for the entirety of her population of analysis, we believed that it accounted for about one in three. So what do these cases look like? 
So these offenders were interesting in the sense that they publicly presented as very well functioning in many dom domains of their lives. So amongst the offenders, um, these were the ones who were the most highly educated. They were also the ones who were consistently employed in well-respected industries. Um, so for example, a number of these men ran their own businesses, worked in well-regarded industries like re real estate, um, education, law, things like that. And these were also the men that occasionally people would say were, were upstanding members of the community. They contributed to charities and so on and so forth. So these were outwardly very well functioning and I guess had the veneer of respectability about them. At time of starting their relationship with the victim, um, there were a number of key characteristics of these relationships. So in the first instance, there were significant power dynamics that favoured the male offender against the victim. So in particular, um, what we found is that quite often there was a significant age difference between the victim and the offender, with the offender being older. Oftentimes this was the victim's first relationship, but other kinds of power dynamics included um, that he was the primary breadwinner, that she um, was looking after the children at home and so wasn't working um, and earning her own money. It could have also been that they had recently migrated to Australia and she didn't know English. And so she was reliant on him to, I guess, negotiate their new, um, I guess, living circumstances. And another key characteristic of these relationships is that they were incredibly controlling. So very often it was described as not physically abusive, but that he was very controlling, domineering um, of her. And this would result in her having very limited options for social, I guess, interaction with other people, um, that she had very little autonomy outside of the home. A key stage in the trajectory for the fixated threat category of offenders um, was a challenge. So this was basically um, the victim challenging the offender's control over her in several key ways. So in over half of these cases, the challenge was primarily that she had left the relationship and refused to reconcile with him. However, in other situations, it was that she had returned to the workforce or that she maintained relationships with family members and friends that he did not approve of, or even that she just wasn't acquiescing to all of his demands on a daily basis. But this was certainly, there was certainly just a generic kind of sense that he had lost control over her and this resulted in him, in him becoming increasingly distressed. So in the context of separation or a, or a more broad kind of challenge um, to his domination, we see an escalation of behaviour, which is what Anna was talking to previously, that because he had lost control, he was, re he was attempting to re-establish his dominance over her. And often this looked like things like um, re repeated attempts to reconcile with her, um, attempts to kind of um, interfere with any new relationships that she had, text bombing as well as physical stalking and online stalking and harassment. However, a key point is, is that even in the context of his repeated attempts to try and get her to reconcile with him, it never worked. She repeatedly refused to reconcile with him. So what we see against this backdrop of um, a challenge to his behaviour and the um, failure of his attempts to re-establish dominance is what Jane Moncton Smith refers to as a change in thinking where he, the offender effectively became more committed or motivated to murder his partner or at least seriously harm her as a means of re-establishing control. And we know that there was a change in thinking because for many in a number of cases, um, the offender engaged in pre-planning behaviour, so he started to plan how he was going to do it. But also in a number of cases, we saw that he verbalised threats to kill her not only to her and to family members, but also to friends um, and to neighbours and onlookers, which I found really shocking that there were so many men who were saying, I'm going to kill her, and ostensibly no one did anything. And at time of the lethal incident, what we saw is that these men were very highly motivated at time of um, entering the same space as the victim, and so entered prepared. They often used force to gain access or subterfuge, so lying about why they were there to get access to her. And they were very um, infrequently intoxicated, so this was planned, premeditated, and very, very thought through. And these were the cases where um, the offender typically 
said that they hadn't, as they pled not guilty, refused to, to admit guilt, and also engaged in kind of um, post-homicide cleaning up kind of behaviours to hide their culpability. So what I guess the fixated threat guys look like is highly motivated, premeditated, and their primary motivation for killing her was a loss of control that she repeatedly challenged by refusing to acquiesce to his need for control. So and these guys accounted for about a third of our sample. And to be honest, I found these guys terrifying. And I think that we should all be really terrifying, terrified of these guys because they're so invisible to all of us because they ostensibly have the veneer of respectability. And so when it happens, we go, we never had a clue. But when you look into their histories, you can, can kind of see that there were warning signs there. All right, so. The next category or trajectory was persistent and disorderly, and they accounted for 40% of our overall sample, and they accounted for the largest majority of our sample overall. So these guys look very, very different to the fixated threat in the sense that they, prior to the relationship starting, they did not necessarily have the veneer of respectability that the fixated threat guys had. They were very frequently in contact with the criminal justice system for violent and non-violent offending, and critically, not only violence towards previous partners or towards family members, but also to strangers, to um, acquaintances at bars and things like that. So they were violent in multiple contexts and in multiple domains of their lives. They had very high levels of mental health disorder, as well as alcohol and substance use disorders. And they were typically characterized as um, being persistently unemployed, undereducated, and they were very highly visible to systems of support for various different reasons. At time of starting their relationship, this was not the first relationship for the victim or the offender. Um, typically, they had prior relationships and prior children. And these relationships relative to the other two categories were relatively short lived. Um, I think the longest was about, I think the median length was about two years, but um, for some of these relationships, they had only been going for two, for a couple of days or a few weeks or months prior to the homicide occurring. A key characteristic of these relationships though, is that they were very, very violent, physically violent and emotionally violent as well. And they were often in contact with the criminal justice system as a result of these types of abuse. However, despite the high levels of violence within the relationship, as well as repeated, um, I guess, separations, um, at time of the homicide, it was very, very rare for these individuals to be separated. So very often they had reconciled or they had never separated prior to the homicide occurring, which is a key difference from fixated threat. So for some of these cases, the point of escalation appeared to be in relation to um, a contact with the criminal justice system, which resulted in a protection order being placed against the offender. And this protection order often told the offender that they couldn't have contact with the victim or that they had to regulate what they were doing with them um, when they did have contact with them. So things like you can't drink while you're together and things like that. And this appeared to, in some cases, result in what we call service avoidance. So uh, the victim and the offender trying to, um, I guess, avoid detection by law enforcement, but also their family members and friends who may not have been supportive of the relationship. So what we saw for a significant proportion of these cases was that they started to spend more time together alone um, and also in isolated areas. So in a number of cases, they actually went camping together for extended periods of time in isolated bushland because they wanted to be able to spend time together without any fear of recrimination. At time of the lethal violence, um, what we talk about with these cases is that, the, is that the decision to kill their partner appeared to be relatively spontaneous. So the victim and the offender were oftentimes very intoxicated. Um, they were oftentimes emotionally distressed and in the context of having an argument, but there seemed to be very low levels of pre-planning and premeditation. Um, so one of the things that we noted about these cases as well is that the lethal violence that was perpetrated at this point often looked very similar to types of abuse that had happened previously within the relationship. It was just that the risk of lethality had increased because of the presence of situation-specific risk factors. So things like um, the presence of a weapon or that she was so highly intoxicated that she couldn't defend herself or the fact that there were no other people around and so there was no one there to intervene and stop him from going too far and things like that. So unlike the fixated threat, which was very planned, premeditated, these need to be very 
spontaneous decisions to kill and there appeared to be situation specific risk factors which increase the risk of lethal violence but there didn't certainly seem to be a lot of um, evidence that they entered the same space with the intention to kill her. The final trajectory that we identified is what we call deterioration acute stresses, and they accounted for about 11% of our overall sample. So it's a smallest group, but they were sufficiently kind of distinct from the other two trajectories that we believed it was its own trajectory. So in the pre-relationship, like the fixated threat offenders, um, the deterioration acute stresses um, cohort had a veneer of respectability in the sense that they didn't um, have very much contact with the criminal justice system. They were described as being, um, you know, good members of the community, things like that. There were high levels of unemployment, but not due to um, factors relating to alcohol intoxication and things like that, but primarily to disability. Because one of the key characteristics associated with this cohort is that they had high levels of physical and um, physical and mental health disabilities which made their ability to um, engage in meaningful and consistent employment quite difficult because they had these chronic health conditions. At time of the relationship starting, these relationships were distinct from the other two in the sense that they were, they were typically described as loving and non-abusive. And I know we need to be really sceptical of those kind of claims considering the covert nature of abuse, but a lot of this information came from family members and the children of the victim and the offender. So there obviously is a little bit more credence that we can put in those assessments. These relationships were also very long lived. The median length of relationship was about 20 years and they were very long standing and committed. So vast majority were married and they had multiple children together. A key stage in this trajectory was what we call the deterioration stage which effectively looks like the deterioration or exacerbation of pre-existing health conditions experienced by the offender, um, which started to impact their daily lives. But we also saw the onset of new kind of stresses and also the interaction between all of these different stresses. So for example, one of the offenders had um, arthritis, which meant that he had to retire early and this contributed to his depression. And then he started to self-medicate as a means of managing that depression. So his chronic health issues triggered unemployment, which then triggered um, deterioration in his mental health as well. So we see it's a very complex kind of web of, um, I guess, factors at play here. In the context of his deteriorating mental and physical health, understandably, um, there was likely to be conflict within the relationship. Uh, primarily uh, verbal arguments and the like, um, typically focused on him uh, changing his behaviours and getting help and assistance with his behaviours. But like the um, persistent and disorderly cohort, sorry, I just realised I've got the wrong title slide up there. It's supposed to say deterioration acute stresses. Um, they were very likely to be reconciled um, at time of the lethal violence occurring. So because they were together at time of the lethal violence occurring, um, the victim and the offender were in the same space um, as, they as any kind of uh, couple would be. However, there was an acute onset of um, mental health symptoms associated with the offender. Um, it could have also been that they were highly intoxicated. Typically an argument broke out and then the offender killed the victim. Um, these cases were really difficult to understand at this point in time, oftentimes because the offender themselves were unable to articulate why they killed their partner. And also um, uh, the judges and coroners themselves seemed uh, to have real issues understanding these cases as well. So in terms of thinking about the implications of this research, we do a lot of unpacking of this within the report in terms of what are the specific intervention points and the prevention mechanisms and things like that. But I think that it really does harken back to that idea of that Anna kind of spoke about, about unpacking stereotypes that we have about domestic violence, but not only about what touch points there are that can potentially facilitate the identification of risk and the mitigation of that risk. So things like um, physical health services, so GPs could be brought into the fold more strongly to be able to identify cases where someone hasn't presented as high risk for experience for perpetrating violence, but due to a chronic onset of conditions may be actually at high risk for perpetrating violence. It also brings to light the need to identify alternative mechanisms um, for, I guess, putting a spotlight on the invisible offenders. We can't wait 
for these guys to do something wrong enough for the criminal justice system to be able to step in and start to do risk plan, risk and safety planning. These guys are covert and we need to be looking at things like intelligence led policing and working more strongly with family law systems to be able to identify these offenders. But more generically, I mean, we started this project with this idea that we were going to be able to say something about victims as well in terms of their trajectories, because we've only really spoken about offenders. There is no information about victims available in the data sets that are currently available. And that seems like a real social issue because we're for, we don't have these lives on record and so we're forgetting them. So even if we look beyond the prevention possibilities that could come out of this information, surely it's something that we should have on record is the detailed life histories of these women because they are not defined by the circumstances of their death. But I'll leave it there because I'm sure I'm over time. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Haley. Very powerful note to finish on. And I guess the common theme with both uh, presentations is around what we need to be doing around recognising coercive control. Um, moving on to the next presentation, we'll move to Kylie, who will share her research on coronial inquests into intimate partner homicide and contextualise the findings of the Death Review Network regarding perpetrators of homicides of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander victims. Thank you, Kylie. Thanks, Padma, and thanks, Anna and Hayley, as well, for your insightful presentations and the context of, of your reports, too. Uh, can I start as it's customary in, in my culture as a Palawa woman uh, to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Bedigal people of the Aurora Nation. I also want to acknowledge that as we gather virtually today, um, we are meeting um, from many traditional lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I pay my respects to our elders, both past and present, and I also acknowledge the many working tirelessly in our communities and with our communities at the present moment to caring for them and doing their best to keeping them safe. I also want to acknowledge uh, my PhD student and research assistant on this project, Mareka Bassani, who has been uh, working with me on, the, on, on this project. Um, in Australia, available data tells us that Indigenous homicide victims are killed more often than not by people known to them, uh, and that Indigenous women are more likely to be killed by their intimate partners. Um, and, and that's not surprising given the data that Hayley uh, and Anna have presented uh, today. But little detail is publicly known outside of isolated media engagement about the lives of the Indigenous women who have been killed, the nature of the violence that they've endured, who the offender was and how they were held accountable for the harms they inflicted, or indeed any kind of reflection on the systems that were or weren't involved in the lives that may have helped to prevent the escalating harm. Uh, that they experienced and their subsequent deaths. Whilst each Australian jurisdiction, um, Bar Tasmania, as Anna has pointed out, have processes for reviewing individually and collectively domestic violence related deaths, they are challenged in saying anything substantive about Indigenous deaths by the small number of deaths each year in individual jurisdictions. This research that I've been doing with Mareka um, overcomes that challenge by reporting on a national study of coronial, coronial records spanning the period 2000 to 2020. We've been looking at 151 Indigenous women's domestic intimate partner um, family violence deaths from around Australia. It's a timely study given uh, increased um, publicity uh, around um, wanting to know more about the missing and murdered First Nations women here in Australia, off the back of a movement occurring internationally. As Anna and Haley have already highlighted, research in this area um, is with, does have its limitations. And certainly for this study, there has been uh, limitations in terms of recognising that in, in all of the jurisdictions, um, you know, we are in 2022, but people still have problems in recording the Indigenous status of victims and offenders. Um, and in both the coronial records, it, but in death data and, and also in um, uh, justice uh, data. Um, it's not insurmountable, but it does rely on Indigenous uh, researchers using all of their skills 
and the, uh, at their disposal to check and double check records and related materials uh, to uh, make sure that, that uh, we do get the Indigenous identification material correct. Uh, for some uh, in this kind of study, it's easier uh, to do. So for, for offenders in particular, for example, um, you can identify Indigenous identity by the legal personnel that um, they've got involved in representing them. For example, the Aboriginal Legal Service. For, for victims, it does take a, a bit more effort in, in terms of, of um, legwork, in terms of finding out um, and confirming Aboriginality. But again, as I said, it's not insurmountable. Uh, the report that Anna uh, has uh, it talked about today um, talks to the very high rate of Indigenous women killed by their Indigenous partners. This finding is consistent with the data we've examined at UNSW and with what we know from the cases appearing uh, before courts across the, the country uh, and in our work with, with communities. But what needs to be said is that this finding is not unusual. Intracultural violence is common in all um, cultures and societies the world over. Um, it makes the news here in Australia and in other colonised contexts because society often has a preconceived stereotype of, of Aboriginal societies. And it's easier to put focus on a violent other rather than to shine a light on that a dominant society also harms, and in this instance, kills their, their women too. It's easier to hold the other accountable. But this situation means at times that there's a lot of news coverage, and at other times, there's a profound silence. And I say that um, in the context of uh, looking at, you know, when we're looking at coronial records in particular, um, there are some that make the news and there are other deaths that don't make the news. And it often begs the question of why. Um, why are some deaths more grievable and to the public than other deaths? And, and that's a, a question that I think that, that we often need to ponder. In terms of, of our data, it's not dissimilar to what Anne has um, reported already. The, the age of victims, 14 to 60 years of death. The length of their relationships span from one month to 23 years. And the relationships were characterised by patterns of persistent violence escalating in severity over time. Uh, so, you know, not dissimilar um, uh, to, to Anna and Haley's findings. The other important point to, to, to make too is that more than half of our victims were mums. Uh, and that the total number of known children who lost a mum, according to our records, were 165 uh, children. Um, four of our women uh, were pregnant at the time of their deaths. Uh, that is quite significant um, for, for our um, communities in particular, who hold children uh, dear. Not that other communities don't, but our communities certainly uh, are profoundly uh, concerned by the number of children that are, that are lost, that, that suffer the loss of their mums in these circumstances. In terms of the context of, of the homicides, 60% um, of, of our women in our sample died from blunt force trauma. Um, many from an assault that went on for hours. Now blunt force trauma often doesn't capture um, what those assaults look and, and feel like. Um, offenders can and do use their bodies to inflict injuries, but they also use whatever is at their disposal. Rocks, sticks, pieces of concrete, furniture, saucepans, power cords, tire rims. These are brutal attacks um, that often are seen as less serious by the courts as they don't involve weapons. Um, and you know, again, when you look at the data and you look at the autopsies that go with these, you know, what we're seeing is significant uh, head injuries and bodily injuries that demonstrate how brutal uh, these uh, uh, particular uh, events are. Whilst I, I appreciate that the court's definitions of weapons being aggravated circumstances, so if, if someone's used a firearm or a knife, that that's aggravated, I would argue that the prolonged beating of these women 
with what arguably are weapons is also aggravated circumstances. Um, and then the other important thing to, to, to note in, in this uh, circumstance is that many of those uh, in our sample uh, are often also pleading guilty um, and that results in a 25% deduction in their sentence. Uh, and so um, we'll talk more about that in, in just a moment. So it, it plays out quite significantly in um, the penalties that, uh, that they're receiving. So we had 151 victims, 106 offenders were sentenced to charges related to the women's deaths. That's quite high. Um, the sentences ranged from seven days to life. Um, the life sentences were given to 37 offenders, um, which equated to nearly 35% of the total sentenced. Excluding, excluding the life sentences for a moment, the average sentence was 10 and a half years with a non-parole period of nearly six years uh, for the offenders who were able to get sentencing re results for. The life sentences were also uh, important uh, to us in, in terms of, of where were those life sentences um, provided. Uh, and those life sentences uh, were dealt out in Western Australia, Queensland and the Northern Territory. The average non-parole period based on, on 20 offenders uh, that we were able to locate um, were, uh, the non-parole period was 19 years. Uh, so that, that's the consequences that are being dealt um, to offenders for um, having um, killed our, our women. The records also talk to a pattern of a lack of professional and institutional accountability. Um, and because it's spanning um, quite a significant period of time, it's interesting to, to look at it in the context of, you know, is there a pattern of, um, you know, this happened in, in 2000, but has police practices improved um, to the present day? Has um, service practices improved? Um, to the present day. And I've got to say that, that um, when you look, at, there is a consistent pattern of continued lack of professional and institutional accountability. The poor police practices talk to, um, you know, having domestic violence policies in place, but them not being followed um, on when police are on the beat, so to speak police attending incident, incidences, but assuming that the situation is alcohol um, driven, separating the parties, telling the, the females to go one way and the men to go the other, but not doing any background checks, and then wondering why the women turn up dead later. Um, and had they done a background check, they would have realised that there's a domestic violence order and that perhaps they should have acted differently in these circumstances. And that's the, the directions that coroners are um, suggesting. Um, there, there is also you know, reflections in, in this data too about the Department of Corrections and uh, conversations around inadequate risk assessments, inadequate parole conditions and also a failure to adequately monitor parole compliance. Um, and so um, men having been um, jailed for, for the, the violence that they've perpetrated on, on women previously, um, being released on parole um, and effectively not being monitored or local police not even being told of what those conditions are. And so when they breach those conditions or breach um, those parole conditions, um, the women have, have no um, safety in those circumstances. And similar to, to what Anna talked about earlier too, it's also a failure to act on breaches to AVOs. Um, the other important thing to, to note as well um, is around multiple agency involvement. Um, so you, you will often see in these records um, that agencies know the precariousness of the situation that these women are in um, and they fail to act um, or they act um, and exacerbate the situation. So it's a, it's a catch 22 in, in some respects. Um, and so it, it's about, um, you know, and, and one point of, of measure that I'll put in there is in, in the context of 
you know, again, policing practice you know, of arresting the woman um, in, in these circumstances um, and in, in that context, leaving the child there um, in harm's way and the result being um, that uh, the child dies or um, in uh, another circumstance, not attending to the, to the woman's um, injuries and they're being a death in custody. So it's that there's a range of issues in the professional and institutional accountability that needs to be addressed. And it's not, they're not anomalies. When you look at this collectively, it's, it, it's a demonstration that we need to do more in this prevention space. Um, and so, just to, to conclude and to, to bring this to a, to a close, I'd say that um, we honour these women's lives by elevating their collective experiences, demonstrating you know, that a singular story can be an anomaly, but a collective voice gives power to the call for action, for change. We look forward to, to sharing some more results of this, um, of this research uh, in the weeks and months ahead as we get this work published. Uh, and we, we thank um, the National Coronial Information Service for giving us access to this material and to Anne Rose for allowing us the opportunity to share this information. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Kylie. Um, really hard to listen to some of that, but um, I think you'll all agree that the three presentations together uh, give us a lot of information on um, what we should be doing in terms of Response systems responses. I'm just there's some questions coming through. Um, uh, Kylie, there was there was a question about uh, whether there's been any analysis of this data by age, and this question is particularly interested in Aboriginal women over 55. Yeah, absolutely. So what we saw in in terms of age is that you know similar to, to Anna's research. Um, at what we see is that um, that the age profile of deaths was similar to non-Indigenous, and in that we saw a bell curve in, in a, a bell curve, an increasing from 14 to 19 to 20 to 24, starting to peak at, at 25 to 29 age group, um, and as well as um, to 30 to 34, and a, and a slight peak again at 35 to 39 before tapering off after that. So um, the women are, seem to be more protected after the age of 40. Um, so I, I think that says something yeah. about um, our community. Anna, do you have, because they're also asking about women over 65. Um, yeah, look, we, as you know, our, I think age range in the data set goes from, I think, 15 through to 80, 80. Mm -hmm. Um, again, there's a concentration in the sort of 30 to 40 group, but it's certainly still a significant proportion over 65. Um, just picking up on what Kylie was saying in terms of sort of case identification um, and, and identifying Aboriginal women as victims, that cohort of older women can be really hard to find, very hard to identify, um, very, you know, the death reviews, um, don't necessarily have an automatic kind of referral that there's been a homicide. You know, a lot of us, we have to do our own kind of surveillance across the system to identify homicides when they've occurred. And then particularly when we're doing um, a retrospective analysis to look at some of the older cases, trying to find the cases of older Aboriginal women, they, they do not feature in the media. It's often very, very limited information, even, you know, having regard to the kind of breadth of information we have access to. Um, so that's you know, it's definitely something that we've identified in our work as a, as a you know, really invisible cohort um, and probably has resulted in underreporting in terms of the national data set so far as, as identifying older Aboriginal women. Anna, while you're there, there's also a question yep. more about um, how death reviews are conducted organisationally. So this question is asking, in the Victorian context, where are the reviews or committees located? So I guess that speaks to the different... Um, sure, yeah. Look, there's different jurisdictions. 
each jurisdictions, you know, I think we all approach our work with the same philosophy and with the same kind of aims um, and, and definitely with that kind of prevention focus. But yes, all the models operate quite differently. Um, in New South Wales, we're a standalone committee um, that reports via Parliament and has a statutory, that's the work is informed by a statutory appointed team. In Victoria um, and in South Australia, they work, they're, both the review teams are located in the coroner's office and so they report, they work with the coroner on cases, on inquests and those, and to inform the findings and, and any recommendations arising out of an inquest where domestic violence is, is an issue um, that's being ventilated in that process. Um, so yeah, they're all in, in WA, the death review mechanisms is part of the ombudsman's function. So again, they are sort of standalone. They have their reports that they that they present um, that get tabled in Parliament. So yeah, there's a kind of range of mechanisms. And in Queensland, it's sort of a hybrid. They have their death review team as a as a standalone committee, as well as working with the coroner on open cases. So yeah, there's there are kind of multiple pathways, I suppose, that this work is is finds its way into the kind of public domain and where those kind of reform efforts sit. But so some are standalone recommendations coming from a, a team, whether informed by a sort of you know statutory appointed board or a reference group, or whether it's um, informing the work of the inquest itself and and then guiding the development of recommendations. Thank you. There's a couple of questions for the whole panel around whether the research includes members of the LGBTIQ plus communities. Um, one questioner says they're hearing a lot about the perpetrator being described as a he and the victim survivor as a she, which they're interpreting as heterosexual relationships. So do you want to speak to that? Um, sure, I'll jump, I'll jump off. Um, I mean, the language that we've adopted is in terms of the biggest cohort of our cases, which is a male predominant abuser who kills a the, the female predominant victim um, and that's I guess in terms of providing a snapshot today because that is the biggest group of cases within our data set that's why it's presented in that way. Um, I would say from the perspective of the network's work and the individual death reviews um, there's some real challenges around you know looking at at homicides in LGBTQ communities. I think you know the, some of the benefits of you know, homicide review process is that by virtue of the homicide, you know, we're afforded a lens into the system and a lens into communities um, and that provides, you know, incredibly valuable insights, but you, it becomes challenged when you're working with a very small cohort of cases. So, for example, in our data set of 311 cases, um, we identified that six were same-sex relationships, both that were men. Um, we didn't identify any, any uh, females who killed a female intimate partner, or people sitting outside, though you know that. Um, so I think that can that can be a real challenge. It's obviously work that needs to be done. You know that's what lends itself to a more of a kind of qualitative review function, but it can be challenging in terms of looking at kind of you know broader trends and patterns. And I think again, there's definitely issues in terms of case identification for those cases. Um, I know from the New South Wales perspective in terms of conducting our case reviews, we've had quite a few cases where um, the, the parties were not identified as being in a relationship for a whole range of reasons, whether that was either it was a clandestine relationship or it just wasn't known to, to parties or responders sitting outside that relationship. Um, so we'll often have, you know, we've got a few cases where they'd be described as flatmates. But then when you kind of start to look through the material, it's clear that they were in a relationship. Um, so there can, there, there's definitely kind of challenges in terms of the case identification and then looking at, at broader patterns. And I think, you know, once you're moving into work with those smaller cohorts is, is where the kind of, you know, your qualitative review processes become, become really important. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, Hayley, do you want to add to that? Um, only to kind of just um, echo what Anna 
and I was saying about um, uh, the issues with identification, which is something that we've certainly found with the National Homicide Monitoring Program, that police will say that they're flatmates and we have a bit of a question mark against it. Um, with the data set that we used, we used the terminology that was used by the courts and the police and the coroners. That doesn't necessarily mean that we didn't misgender someone. Um, it's just that's how um, we, were, we were kind of aligned on the language. But I think that there's certainly more work that is being done at the moment to make the collection of this data more consistent with best practice principles in terms of collecting information about sex assigned at birth and gender identity. Um, so hopefully we'll be better placed to answer some of those questions in the future. Thank you. Um, for Kylie, in regard to the appalling low sentence lengths for Aboriginal offenders, can you comment on how this compares to average sentences for Caucasian offenders? Is, this a, is there a significant difference um, and is it likely to be informed by stereotypes that paint Aboriginal people as inherently violent or lawless? Um, that's a very good question <laughs> um, and I think that, that it, it's something that, that we're absolutely looking into at the present time. I, I think that it requires a, a, um, a, it's a complex answer because it requires looking at um, criminal history of the, the offender um, and looking at whether um, and, and it goes to, to the points that Hayley talked about previously looking at um, the points around whether they've been involved in the criminal justice system previously uh, and uh, the nature of that offending uh, and what does that mean then in terms of how uh, the judge in these matters can then sentence in the present moment and so and what that then looks like when we compare that to non-Indigenous offenders who, who have offended similarly um, what does that look like uh, and how can you compare the both um, so it's complex. Um, it's not like comparing apple for apple. Um, we do have to look at this in, in a very complex way. Um, and so uh, that, that's the nature of us doing uh, the current research at the present time to actually look at is uh, the offenders in these cases being treated more harshly? Um, is there uh, circumstances being taken into account or do we need to um, be drawing attention to um, the, the surrounding justice issues that, that are involved? Um, but again, the other important point in all of this is also being mindful of, as I pointed out in, in my presentation, the brutality of the violence, um, because I don't think that we can escape that. Um, and the nature of some of those coronial inquests is that, that it is incredibly brutal. Yeah. I think as well, we really, I mean, there needs to be kind of more work done and it's it's work that we are kind of capturing both within the individual death mm -hmm. reviews and, and as a network, but have not yet reported on it because as you know, Carly has rightly pointed out, it's an incredibly kind of complex issue. But yeah. I mean, I guess, the, you know, just, and it was some, an issue that I'd flagged so far as um, criminal justice responses to women who killed their abusive partner. And I think, you know, we had a, a, a the disproportion of Aboriginal women who uh, had um, were convicted of killing their intimate partner, and looking at, at the way the justice system responds to those women and their histories of violence, um, you know, having regard to the likelihood of of them having a criminal history by virtue of all the reasons that Carly has talked about, um, but you know, definitely, I think more work to be done to kind of unpack some of those cases. Mm. Sorry, a um, uh, couple of questions on um, non-English speaking background victims. So how can we improve data collection methods and enact systemic reforms to respond to the experience of intimate partner homicide victims and offenders from non-English speaking backgrounds? Uh, start with that. Yeah, look, I can jump off here again. Look, the the way that we've presented um, data around culturally and linguistically diverse peoples in in this current report is very very big picture. Um, at the moment, we've only presented so far as country of birth, 
um, to get a kind of snapshot, which which pay, I think was about 30% of both um, offenders and victims were born outside of Australia, which is, you know, still an important finding, I think, in terms of kind of resisting some of the kind of misconceptions and stereotypes about people from outside of Australia and picking up again, Kylie, in terms of what you were saying about sort of othering and and misconceptions that people from particular you know particular cultural backgrounds are, are more violent. Um, that 30% sits at about, you know, that shows it's not an overrepresentation of people born outside Australia. But, you know, I think the work that the individual death reviews obviously goes into far more detail about what the kind of particular issues may be for both um, victims and perpetrators who come from non-English speaking backgrounds and some of those, you know, the persistent obstacles in terms of, you know, pathways to safety for those victims. Um, so, but certainly more work from from a network's perspective to do in terms of, of looking at that data. Again, having the kind of challenge of it being a relatively small percentage of the broader cohort, um, and so some of the challenges there, I suppose, around around looking at trend and pattern data. Um, and again, you know, some of that work lends itself more to to the kind of qualitative reviews that individual death reviews are undertaking. Um, but yeah, that's work that we're looking to kind of further develop. Obviously, you know, the experience of a migrant that comes from the UK to live in Australia versus someone who comes as a you know refugee from a non-English speaking country or a conflict zone. Or, you know, they're going to be very different experiences. So you know, at the moment, the networks data is sitting at that a very big big picture data, um, yep. but looking to further develop that. Yeah. Haley, did you have any? demographic information about your perpetrators? Yep, so we had 31% of our perpetrators uh, were born overseas and 47 of those 61 were born in a country where English was not a primary language. Um, so we have a section in the report which looks at the role of pre and post migration stresses in the intimate partner homicide pathways because we identified it as a consistent issue and that there were multiple kind of um, I guess presenting concerns I guess and potential points of intervention so um, uh, many men who came from particular countries had experiences of witnessing extreme violence or religious persecution um, they experienced issues integrating in Australia um, and even those who um, were able to find employment and things like that there were still stresses around there's a lot of literature around the um, emotional distress associated with the loss of cultural understanding of their place in the world and things like that. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting area and it's something that's starting to be written more about um, in terms of understanding the unique context within which these homicides occur. Um, and certainly we found that the manifestations of coercive control looked quite different and things like that. So I think this is an area for more research Yep. Um, and certainly something uh, that needs to be recognised as, um, you know, posing its own kind of issues. But yeah, we have some, we do have quite a bit about it in the report. Um, Hayley, there's also a question for you on uh, the behaviours of the outliers of the three categories. Did the outliers share some similarities in behaviour or were they just all very different and couldn't be um, brought into any of the categories? Um, they were all very different. Um, so we had two uh, that would be classified, I guess, as mercy killings. Um, so I guess part of our definition was that we started broad. We basically were like a male, a male person murders their intimate um, female intimate partner. So we didn't have a requirement that there was a history of violence within those relationships. And a couple of those outlier cases were things like mercy killings. There were two cases where the offender was found not guilty due to self-defence um, because the female was actually identified as a primary perpetrator and there were very clear markers that she was the primary perpetrator. Um, and then there were others that we just defied classification because we were just like, <laughs> either there was just very little information or it was just such a, a misunder like a, in a, unable to un identify and classify easily so there wasn't any consistency except that they were inconsistent with each other and the trajectories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this might be for um, Kylie and Anna. 
to what extent are governments implementing the recommendations of inquiries and research? So I guess death reviews and coronial processes to prevent intimate partner homicide. I have lots of views on this, but you go for it. Anna? Well, look, I mean, I guess, speaking, I guess, from putting my New South Wales hat back on, we're soon to release our um, next DVDIT report, which we have included an analysis of all of the recommendations the team has made to date. So in, in the sort of, since the team was established in 2011, we've made 122 recommendations. Um, a significant, like, I think we're sitting at about half, I need to check the numbers around of the, the recommendations um, we have coded as being implemented and that can, uh, has a sort of particular meaning in terms of the, the full intent of, of what the recommendation was seeking to achieve has in fact happened and has, that work has completed. Um, then we are looking at recommendations that are sort of where work has commenced and it's ongoing and then recommendations where work may have commenced and stalled or there's been no action at all. Um, we have found that a significant proportion of our recommendations relating to um, you know, domestic violence in Aboriginal communities are sitting within that group of, of work that may have commenced but stalled um, or where work has not sort of effectively been really commenced to give effect to what it was that the team, the issue that the team was trying to address. I mean, I think, you know, me measuring implementation of recommendations is, is really, really challenging work. And I think if you look, for example, to, you know, the, the process for monitoring recommendations they have following the, um, the Family Violence Royal Commission, you know, that's an enormous amount of work and enormous amount of resources that are going in, to, and, and rightly so, to monitoring that work. Um, but it's, it's work that can be really challenging. This, so for this report, um, my research analyst and I have undertaken this, the, the Rex analysis ourselves, but it's a huge amount of work. And then, you know, measure what do you mean by kind of successful or full implementation and, and, and measuring that can be really hard. And I don't think that's not something that's unique to death reviews. I think it's it's any body that who sort of seeks to give effect to its reform agenda through that process of recommendations. Um, I think meet those same challenges, but it's 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 hard. I mean, it's not to say that it's it, you know it's not it's not a fatal process. I think it's you know we we have seen really positive change that's come through as a result of recommendations made by our team, which is really encouraging, um, and some really you know, significant pieces of work that that have progressed. Sometimes taking a number of years to progress, um, and you know, and rightly so, but it, it's um, it's a it's a difficult process to measure in terms of what your success is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah I, I think I, I concur with Anna. I think that um, progress is it can um, be slow, <laughs> um, and, and I, I suppose for the Indigenous community, I, we get frustrated. There there are a lot of reports and um, recommendations um, sit in a lot of reports and uh, yet because we have such a high incidence of, of violence in our communities and a high incidence of, of deaths, um, we expect the pace at which change happens to be faster than it is. Um, we expect there to be urgency in this and uh, there is frustration um, that there isn't urgency. Um, and so the, the questions I, I think remain about, well, why isn't there urgency? You know, when we look at the women's groups and the services that are, are armed and ready to, to get in and do the work, uh, they're, they're asking, well, why, why aren't we getting funded? Why aren't we getting resourced? Why aren't we getting what we need to be able to, to get in and get what needs to be done done? Um, and so, you know, those questions to, in the in the, the space that that nobody talks about. Um, and so, um, I suppose where the motivation um, still remains is in the community. You know, the motivation and the support and the willingness to effect change, and where change is happening, is in the community. 
you know, we have um, the stories, we have, um, and, and you, you, you will, you'll open a newspaper, you'll open a social media post and you'll see a death in our community today or tomorrow. But you go out to those communities today um, and the hope and the motivation to change something um, mm. is in those communities today. Um, and I think that that is uh, what we need to work with, right? Mm. Um, and so waiting for a recommendation isn't going to affect that change that needs to happen in our community today. That's our, our women predominantly, um, but our men are behind that too. That's our women getting out there and getting that work done. Um, and it's about how we keep them motivated and supported um, to, to be able to continue to do that work. Um, and because, you know, it, 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 they live and breathe this every single day. Yeah. Um, and they have the solutions. Yeah, they have the solutions. We just yeah. need to, to get behind them. Um, it's uh, not a lot to ask. I almost want us to stop there because that's such a good point to stop, but there's still lots of questions coming through. One yep. of which is around um, the findings of the number of intimate partner homicides following the issue of an intervention or order of sorts is terrifying. Have any frontline agencies such as state police um, authorities engaged with this information to better inform practice? And to the panelists have any suggestion do the panelists have any suggestions for how we as practitioners can make better use of of these orders to protect victims rather than in placing them at greater risk that's a big question but i mean um at least in terms of Haley, have uh the police departments engaged with this research or how do we make sure that this research gets to them to inform their practice um, so I, I don't think that the research findings that any of us have described is necessarily shocking because we know that the protection order system is broken. We know that it doesn't like we know that it works in some circumstances, but it doesn't work in all circumstances. And I still am gobsmacked by the one stop shop approach to protection orders in that you get it, it's done, go away when really we know that offenders are incredibly manipulative and they do find ways of breaching those orders in the grey areas. So when someone reports it, the police come back and say, well, technically it's not a breach. And so what kind of message does, does that send to her, but also to him that he can continue to perpetrate these types of abuse? And it's just mind boggling. I think though that one of the key findings from our research was about when a protection order was put in place in the context of the persistent and disorderly and this service avoidance that started as a result. I mean, I think that we have to rec recognise that even with the protection order in place, um, problematically called breaches by consent, um, people are going to continue to want to have that relationship. And even and us saying leave, don't, is not working and it's not helpful because all we're doing then is pushing the issue further underground. So again, it's that thing of like, why is it such a one-stop shop? You have your protection order, go away, but where's the follow-up safety planning? Mm. Like, where is that additional kind of support um, to kind of check on her and see how the order is going and to have an open and frank conversation about what safety looks like? Because so many women died unnecessarily because they were trying to avoid people from knowing that she was continuing this relationship in like you know the bush where they weren't going to be detected and that's heartbreaking mm. that these women died alone because they were worried that the systems that we put in place to protect them were going to persecute someone that they didn't want to be persecuted so i think it's that thing of the protection order system is broken the research clearly demonstrates that again but it's as kylie kind of said we don't need another recommendation to be able to act on what we already kind of know. We need to reform the protection order system and we need to be more nuanced and we need to do additional safety planning around it. Sorry, I'll stop. And it's not an issue that just lies at the feet of police. I mean, we need to look at what happens in terms of court processes and the fact that the majority of, of protection orders are consent orders, which is a reflection of the, you know, the incredible high volumes of cases coming through the local courts and you know the kind of reliance on the parties negotiating 
consent orders. I mean, there's a whole lot of other reasons why a victim might consent to orders, um, but it's, it's, you know, it, it opens up the kind of potential for, for abusers to, to kind of take advantage of strains on the system, mm -hmm. for example, within the court context to, to kind of, you know, co-opt that system to continue their abuse or to kind of be able to negotiate a more favourable outcome. So, you know, the, the end point being that the, the victim doesn't get the protection that she kind of needs and sought. Um, so it's a kind of, it's a system-wide issue. It doesn't just sit with police. And I think, look, it's something that's been kind of, you know, it's interesting to look at how this will be responded to in the context of criminalising coercive control. Um, and, and how that will fit in terms of, of the, protect, the protection order system um, and, you know, all of those issues around misidentification of, of the predominant aggressor. Um, and, you know, I think there's obviously a, a growing body of work that has looked at, at the way, um, it, you know, the, the kind of terribly harmful impacts of misidentifying victims as, as the, the defendant in a protection order. Um, but I think, you know, once again, kind of more work to be done to better understand how those systems are failing to keep victims safe. And, you know, and as Hayley said, uh, you know, from a kind of practice point of view, it causes us to reflect on, you know, very much the, the misconception that separation equals safety and, and assumptions that get made by responders and probably again by virtue of the kind of strains of the, the sheer volume of cases that they're working with, that if someone has an ABO in place um, and the relationship has ended, therefore their kind of level of risk has, has reduced um, and we, we know that's just not the case. Carly, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, it, it, from a practice perspective, it, it's the important thing is around the reflective practice. I, I think too often, you know, we get caught up in our crisis delivery that we don't take time to, to reflect on the work that we're doing and how we can improve our practice. And I think that it's critical to, um, to the work that we do and to you know, you know the reforms that are undertaking that, that are being um, put into place in all of our jurisdictions whether we're introducing coercive control reforms or introducing um, interagency changes that we actually sit back and reflect on our practices we know in our gut as practitioners whether our interaction with somebody today was um, worthwhile or not whether it was um, good, whether we had an impact, um, whether it, whether that person's going to come back or not, um, and why they will or won't come back. And so it's important for us to, to actually sit back and reflect and think about how we can do things different, how we can improve upon our practice and make sure that, that we follow up um, on the circumstances that, um, that took place in, in that interaction. And um, because those kind of reflections will save a life. Um, mm. and, and I can't stress that enough. Um, it is, that will save a life. Um, and, you know, when I sit and teach with my students, I often ask them to, to think about, you know, what kind of biases are you bringing to your interaction? Mm. You know, do we actually think about that? What lens are you using when you interact with this person? You know, is it your lens um, from your place of, of being brought up in a particular class and um, family life? Or is it a, a lens of, of looking and walking in the shoes of the person in front of you? I um, mean, understanding the context in which they're living. Um, and if you can understand their context, um, how would you support them in that moment? Um, we need to be critically reflective of what we're doing to, to help save a life and to, to improve their circumstances in a way that is self-determining and empowering from, from, for them um, and, and for their circumstance. Um, we have to, to be able to allow them to make some decisions in this context too. It, it's not for us to, to make those decisions, it's for them to make those decisions with as much information that we can give them um, so that they're empowered to, to, to be in control. Wonderful. We've got so many more questions coming through and we could talk about this for hours, I'm sure. But um, we've come to the end of our time today. 
Uh, but before we go, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Hayley, Anna and Kylie for um, so generously sharing your, your research with us in an accessible way, in a way that actually informs not only our knowledge, but also how we can turn that into practice. Um, as I said at the start, the webinar will be available on the ANROS website um, soon for on-demand viewing. As you exit, please try and um, do the survey. And for any researchers tuning in today, if you're working on projects addressing violence against women, you can submit your project to ANRO's Register of Active Research. Um, that's really useful for uh, people in the sector to be able to see. So thanks again to the panelists and on behalf of ANROS, bye for now. <laughs>